and a welcome to this third video dedicated to the history of the Amelie Sphere. Today we're going to go a little further um, with regard to our knowledge of our guest by talking a little about its um, history. So before we get started, uh, we remember in the previous video, we looked at where this name came from, this celestial sphere, um, the starry sky that surrounds us with the Earth at the center. This object modelizes the apparent movement of the sky, um, and the sphere evolves within 24 hours. It's, of course, an apparent uh, movement. We explain that. Uh, but it's a very important movement, and it's based on this apparent movement that uh, a astrology um, is, uh, is base. Um, so the word armillary means armilla, as we said, which is a bracelet or a ring. And you can see that this sphere is constituted of a number of bracelets that materialize certain elements, certain landmarks of the sphere. And it's these elements that we are going to study in the following videos. So in this um, current video, we're not going to look at too much detail of um, celestial elements, but we're going to try and understand where this object comes from, who invented it, and how it was used. We're also going to look at how um, closely uh, linked to astrology it is. Uh, it's perhaps one of the objects that best represents and symbolizes the union between astrology and astronomy. So the story of the armillary sphere will also um, bring us to the story of astrology and some uh, great men um, great astrologers. Um, so where does this uh, magnificent object come from? Where does it come from? So in order to understand this, we're going to um, look at the beginning of this love story between astrology and astronomy. We're going to start two and a half to three thousand years ago. So as you can imagine, in order to build this model of the sky, this 3D representation, um, this armillary sphere, uh, you know, you had to spend a lot of time observing the sky. The first great observers of the sky of the antiquity were the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans. They used to observe the sky meticulously and recorded all the da their data. In modern language, you could say that they constituted the very first database of celestial phenomena. So, yeah, astrological database. Um, and thanks to all this knowledge, they were able to predict the exact positions of the moon and the planets, etc. So they were the first great observers of the sky, the Babylonians. And next uh, come the Greeks. The Greeks, um, they um, mathematized, uh, modelized, theorized the sky. We think that the armillary sphere was invented by the Greeks. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a typically Greek object, an object that translates the geometry of the sky. Um, so if we look at a few um, great men um, who talk about the armillary sphere in ancient Greece. Plato, Plato, 4th century uh, BC, in his book Timaeus, um, he basically said um, there's no point in um, trying to understand celestial phenomena if you don't have a mechanical representation of movements, which leads to believe that um, he'd already seen this type of object. And also what is interesting um, is that it shows the extent to which the movements of the sky are difficult to conceptualize, even for somebody such as Plato, um, who's, you know, a pretty clever uh, gentleman. And he clearly says that it's difficult to conceptualize the sky without having an object that enables us to do that. So that shows the extent to which the armillary sphere is essential. And let's also mention Cicero. I mean, he isn't Greek, but it's interesting. He wrote a passage where he refers to the armillary sphere. And more precisely, um, in his book, he refers to Archimedes' armillary sphere. Um, 
third century BC, um, an object that was apparently um, very precious um, to this great scholar. And Archimedes was the author of a treaty on Sphopia. Uh, Sphopia was a science in antiquity, a science of the representation of the celestial globe. So Greeks, um, you know, there was a great presence of the Amadeus sphere in, uh, in Greece. So the Romans next. Um, the Romans also used the Amadeus sphere a lot. Astrology uh, was very present in Roman times. I mean, sometimes it was for the masses, you know, but uh, also sometimes um, it was um, very scientific astrology or astronomy. Uh, Ptolemy, 2nd century um, BC, was a great scholar who many astrologers and astronomers refer to for over 1,500 years. Um, so you can't talk about the Amadeus sphere without mentioning his book, um, the Tetra Bibles, which is the Bible of astrologers for a number of centuries. And uh, Ptolemy used an Amadeus sphere to establish the cartography of the sky. Um, but what I need to mention is that for uh, Ptolemy, the Amelie sphere, was a scientific uh, tool, um, you know, so aimed, it was an educational um, tool to understand and explain the movements of the sky, but also, and very significantly, a scientific tool. And so that's the case with uh, Ptolemy. So next there's the Middle Age. Um, so the uh, yeah in the Middle Age there was a lot of interest um, in the Amadeus sphere and a lot of Amadeus spheres were built and then the Renaissance that really was the golden age of the Amadeus sphere it's a symbol a scientific object and a symbol of knowledge a symbol of wisdom you can see uh, many Amadeus spheres. Uh, from the Renaissance in many European museums. At the Va in the Vatican, for example, there are many armillary spheres in the Vatican. And um, the greatest armillary spheres um, that are no longer among us, unfortunately, but there are documents that refer to them, uh, will actually be designed by the greatest astronomer of the uh, 16th century, Tycho Brahe, who um, was also an astrologer. And uh, Tycho Brahe designed some armillary spheres that went from one meter to, to two and a half meters in diameter. So you can imagine, in fact, for those who are familiar with the famous Coronelli globes that are exhibited in the uh, National Library in Paris, um, they were designed under Louis XIV. They're four meters in diameter. Well, these globes, um, you know, which are purely for decorative purposes, can give you an idea of the gigantic size of the objects that were designed by Tycho Brahe. And of, of course, the objects that he did, um, you know, that he didn't do them for educational purposes. Um, he was a great astronomer, and um, they were scientific objects, very precise scientific objects, in order to study the sky, to map the sky. Um, Tycho Brahe gave the exact position of more than a thousand stars in our uh, celestial sphere. So the age of um, enlightenment, um, during the age of enlightenment, it became a symbol of science. Um, it's in a lot of paintings. Um, it's a symbol of knowledge and science. Colbert, for instance, you can see Colbert presenting um, it to the uh, members of the uh, Academy of Science. Um, also to be mentioned as a symbol is that the armillary sphere is, uh, appears on the Portuguese flag. And of course, you know, it's a reminder of the glorious maritime history of uh, Portugal, um, Magellan, for instance. And uh, sailors didn't use an uh, armillary sphere, but astrolabes. We'll see it in video number 11. And the astrolab is a cousin of the armillary sphere, um, which is why the armillary sphere is uh, uh, present on the uh, Portuguese flag.
So today, um, you don't see the young Bedouin sphere that often. It's more of an object of the past. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a pity because it's an object that is really helpful when it comes to understanding the sky. It should be present in schools or at least in astronomy and astrology schools. And unfortunately, it often isn't the case. As I said, it's a pity. And that is one of the reasons that motivated me to actually do these videos. So I'm going to leave it at that. In video number four, we're going to uh, really try and better understand this object and uh, the various rings of this object. And uh, as a reminder, if you want to go further, remember there is uh, video number 12 with bibliographical references. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, I'll see you very soon. Goodbye.